This guy walks up to me and he bows to me, says, hi, Master Finesse, my name is Michael Jackson, pleased to meet you. The child abuse allegations was Michael the creator of his own destiny. He was the creator of his own destiny. Gary Geller, he would say, this is not looking good to the world. You need to start cleaning up your image a bit. Are you saying kids did or didn't sleep in his bed? They did not sleep with him in his bed. He had a panic room in his room. He sleeps in an oxygen tent. Were these other things true as well? This is where the story goes a bit wild. He started to realise he could manipulate mainstream media extremely well, make billions off the back of it, and his record sales would go through the roof, and create the mystique that became Michael Jackson, which also backfired on him too. But as well as being friends, you, you would do security for him as yeah. well. He offered me money, but I didn't want his money. I was already a millionaire before I met the guy. You were friends with him up until up until his death? Yeah, I spoke to him two nights before he died. He called me up erratic, unhappy. I knew something was wrong. I didn't think he was gonna die. Hey, Matt Haycox here with a quick interruption just to say, I hope you're liking the show, but please, please like, subscribe or comment. That's how we can bring you better guests. That's how we can make the show better each week. So please, please, that's all I ever ask of you. We never charge. We never ask anything else. Just please give us a few moments of your time. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. I'm very excited. I was doing a, a little bit of prep this morning, just watching a couple, uh, couple of old episodes of other podcasts you've done. So I know there's going to be uh, some super exciting things. Uh, there's a lot you've talked about already, and maybe we'll find some different angles as sure. well. But uh, your story is, uh, is certainly an adventurous one. Crazy life. I mean, look, let's, let's go back to the beginning, um, because I guess, you know, <laughs> each there's many different parts to this, and each, each one leads on to the next. Uh, Wales you were brought up in, is that where you're from? No, it's not far from there, Swindon. Swindon. Yeah, Swindon, about an hour from there. And um, tell me about your childhood, because I think you were bullied as a child, which is ultimately what led on yeah. to your adventure into martial arts. That's what made me. I know it sounds weird, but I got bullied by a kid at school, and it was, yeah, it was tough going between the ages of five and seven by one particular kid. What does bullying mean as a five or six year old? I mean, just no, horrible names. When you look back at it now, it's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? And it's, uh, but yeah, it's getting kicked under the table and. Stealing your milk, okay. <laughs> <laughs> cause names. I used to hide in the playground. I mean, the kid was just big compared to me. I was a skinny little flipping tiny guy and very underconfident, hated school, couldn't do anything at school. And if you're underconfident at school, you just attract, you just attract these kind of people. This kid was from a wealthy family, super successful. Yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those things. It was meant to happen because it didn't happen that I would never have sought out looking to do martial arts and none of this whole crazy stuff has happened and we're good friends me and him now we we actually met on national tv on a tv show called this morning in the uk you were pushing him around in his wheelchair <laughs> <laughs> they were worried i was gonna kick him in the head or something but now we we met in front of millions of people first time in 32 years and now he's my anti-bully ambassador oh really organization yeah but whose idea was it back then to get into martial arts i mean were you coming home crying about this and... yeah 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 it was a massive thing I, my mum was trying to get him expelled from school and it was constant or bruised all the time and to try and make up excuses of why I couldn't go to school, you know, I'm not feeling very well, I was very good at doing that. Yeah, just coming home and, and, and basically there was a kid next to me in the class and he did a martial art called Jiu Jitsu. And he said, you know, Matt, come along to the class because you can defend yourself against Anthony, he was the bully. And I went to the class and I didn't like that particular martial art, but in the room next door, there's another one called Taekwondo. And I had long legs. And obviously not as long as they are now when you're, when you're like seven years old, but I was very good at Taekwondo for some reason. I could do the splits already, all the high kicks. And for, for a change, I felt I was getting praised for my instructor for something I was good at rather than getting criticized all the time for not being able to draw dinosaurs properly at school and doing pointless stuff that I was never gonna use. So I just found my purpose, my passion. I just knew that was gonna be my career path. Tell me, I mean, as a parent now, uh, and I guess you know, we, we do live in a, a slightly different uh, society than uh, than thirty odd years ago you know, when you were a kid. I mean, what what would you say to your kids who were in the same position as you, or or what would you do? You know, because I think you know. <laughs> On the one hand, you get the parents who want to go into school and say, my kid's getting bullied, you know, you need to tell that kid off, you need to suspend him, you need to, to expel him. Um, and it, invariably what happens is, you know, the kid finds out and he bullies you more and bullies you more. You know, the flip side is, you know, as a parent, you say, right, go and give him a good kicking, which, uh, you know, might, might, might shut him up, uh, but then probably gets you expelled. And, uh, you know, I mean, what, what would you do? Is there a happy medium? Yeah, it's a good question. I've not been asked this one before. So uh, if, if I put my head teacher hat on as the owner of the biggest martial arts chain in the world, that I need to say, 
I need to say the right thing, which is seek out help, basically. And that's why we've done well. We provide instructors for these kids to go to. But for my own children, Matt, I think that's an important... I've got six children that I would openly want them to defend themselves at school. Because you're all right. The more complaining you do, it gets back to the parent and the parent slaps the kid and then the kid comes back even more angry and you get bullied even more. But more importantly than that, bullying is a part of life. I get bullied now as we're doing this podcast, as people talking about me, Instagram, X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, Facebook, talking nonsense about me. Bullying is life. It's just the way it is. The more you put yourself out there, the more you're going to be challenged. Your haters are really your lovers. They're your free publicists. And and once you understand that concept, you have to roll over it. So for my own kids, I tell them that you're going to have challenges at school. Not everyone's going to like you. There's going to be peer pressure. And you need to be able to stand up to that. That's just the way life is. And when you're older, it's never going to stop. You're always going to feel that the world's unfair, that people are going to treat you bad. And that's just the way it is. And I think as well, you know, a kind of a let's say a non-physical but but business analogy, and it, you know, and it is it's it is bullying in its own way. Is that ultimately, you know, someone's always going to want to take your lunch. You know, mm. wh- whether whether they're doing it by t- calling you names, whether they're doing it by kicking you for let's say for for no benefit other than their own ego and you know, trying to show off in the schoolyard, or whether this is business and you know, someone wants to expand into your territory you know, to, to sell a cheaper coffee, to sell a better burger, you know, whatever it may be. There's always going to be someone who's after what you've got, um, and you know you, you've got to be able to find a way to stand to stand your ground and to fight back in in, in any field. And I know you know some people listening to this might be thinking, "Oh, well, how the hell have we gone from 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 bullying to business?" But you know th- th- yeah. they, they, they are the same thing. You know, every day I wake up, someone wants my customers, someone wants yeah, my yeah, message, yeah. someone wants something, and uh, you know it, it's, it's it's my job to defend that in whatever way it is. I'm not saying I'm going around stabbing people, but you know you, you you've got to yeah, you've the got legal to be able system. To, and lawsuits and things and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it never, it never stops. And it, that's an interesting point. You, you're here to defend your family, your friends and your network and, and your name and your brand and so forth. And yeah, to me, you've you got to embrace it. I mean, I wouldn't say I had it hard as a bully kid. Interesting enough, my parents' mechanism to try and stop it was keep changing me schools. But every time I change school, because I'm the underconfident, shy kid, she used to attract another bully. So you, you just got to teach kids to understand, to recognise who is the bully and to stay away from them. And more confident I've got, it's just started to fade away. It went, you know, and I've built obviously a huge career out of teaching stuff that the school system don't teach now, which includes anti-bullying techniques, you know, and made a fortune out of it. And I, there's a big gap there, but a lot of it's down to boredom at school. You're getting taught things that are outdated and, and kids are bored and they're picking on each other and you can't teach 30, 40 kids the same way. They're all individuals. And for me, when I look at my, back at my school life, it was a complete waste of that time. Yeah, I just com- complete nonsense. None of it ever benefited me at all. So you were about seven when the martial arts started? I was seven years old when I started. And, and I think I've read that you were a black belt by the time you were 12? I was 12, yeah. And, and, and in real terms, I mean, like, as a 12-year-old black belt, I mean, are you, are you still are you super handy? I mean, obviously, I'm sure you can knack the other 12-year-olds, but if, a, if an 18-year-old comes along, are you, are you still like a weak 12-year-old, or can you handle yourself in yeah. those situations? So, so being a black belt doesn't make, make you the... I mean, back then, I mean, it was brutal training that we had. I mean, you're from the north of the UK, so you've... Martial arts came from like the north, like from the Doncaster area. It was, it was massive. That's where I took my black belt, funny enough. So in terms of defending yourself, you, you just get educated in the end that you don't use it for that. You don't need to use it for that. You wouldn't give somebody the, the pleasure to kick them around the head or whatever. It, it doesn't happen. Plus, people tend to leave you alone when you're the 12-year-old black belt. They don't want to come near you, you know, they the bullying stopped by that point. And you're so damn confident because you have this big goal of becoming a black belt. And on the way, you've got these little color belts that you're working towards. And each one just ups your confidence. So time you get to black belt, you're not cared about the bully anymore, about someone taking the mick out of you, but saying bad things about you. You don't get in those situations. So, so yeah, you can defend yourself, but you have to be realistic, right? If you're going to have like some strong 25, 30-year-old guy who's, you know, five or six stones heavier than you, He's got a knife or something, and, and no matter what, you're not who you are. You're Bruce Lee. You can defend yourself against that type of stuff. Like I got interviewed recently by the media in the UK. We had this big fuss about these exile bully dogs, you know. And they said, "Matt, can you realistically defend yourself against one of them with martial arts?" Of course you can. You got to be honest. You got a pair of jeans on, tight jeans on. 
You're not going to be doing high kicks, are you? When you're in your 40s <laughs> trying to do those high kicks I used to be famous for in my early 20s, it's like, I'll end up having a flipping hip replacement, you know? What do I want to be doing that for? So you've got <laughs> I'm going to ask what you're doing with tight jeans and in your 40s anyway. <laughs> yeah, that too, yeah, that as well. Yeah, no, that's not for me. But no, you have to be realistic with this stuff. So, 12-year-old black belt, you opened your first business, uh, you opened, uh, being a karate studio when you were 16 years old. Yep. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you go from doing it as a hobby to wanting to do it as a business? And I guess, what was your, your entrepreneurial thought process and path at that time? Well, I say it's entrepreneurial. I, I just, I was in my mathematics class at 13 years old in secondary school. And I remember, because I, I kept the exercise book. Remember we had these exercise books? Yeah, yeah. We've got iPads now, haven't they? For a per class, maths and religious studies the and science. The maths ones used to have little square yeah, yeah, boxes Yeah, that's in. right, yeah. And on the back of it, I just turned to the back page and I wrote down a series of goals because the teacher at the time was teaching us how, how many different ways can you put 50p into a red telephone box? Because they were a thing back then. They're like museum pieces now, aren't they? You put two 20p's and a 10 or five 10p's. I just thought, it's exactly ridiculous. I'm never going to use this in my life. So I turned to the back of it and I got thinking, what can I do? And I want, I was a big fan of like watching Jean-Claude Van Damme back then. And so some of the goals I put down were like doing how to do the size splits on the chairs. I want to achieve that by the time I'm 18. I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 18. I want a Ferrari because my brother used to draw Ferraris. He's a, a car designer. So I grew up with Ferrari pictures all over all over the house. I was in, insane the way he could draw them. So I wanted to own a Ferrari by the time I was 18. Have a six pack, big muscles, and so forth. And I, that was my focus for secondary school. That's what got me through the damn process because I hated it. I left school with no qualifications whatsoever, other than my martial arts black belt. I did a personal trainer qualification just because I enjoyed that, and I worked in the gym in the evenings. How old were you? Sixteen. Okay. Yeah, I did the baller qualification. I don't know if it's still around any British British Amateur Weightlifting Association. Did that college? You could gain that in like six months. I mean, you can get them in a day now. I think can't you? Personal trainer qualifications. And then um, back was up against the wall. What can I do? I mean, my mum is one of 14 children. She was a lawyer. They're all university graduates. And then my dad's from a get a trade background. He worked for Brunel Railways, an engineer. So the, my granddad from that side wanted me to get a trade, but electrician, plumber. I didn't want to do any of that. I just wanted to teach martial arts for a living, but no one had done that before. This was the challenge. So the, you can kind of get by by collecting a three pound a class into an ice cream container that's what we used to collect it in and take it to the bank but then when the sun's out which is pretty rare in the uk i like to buy here or holiday term or whatever you don't get paid people don't turn up anymore so law of attraction whatever the hell you want to call it i moved into a bed sit my parents didn't believe in what i was doing why did you move out they wanted you to live? i moved out 16 i didn't get on my dad we clashed he, he didn't believe he called martial arts legalized violence thought I was throwing my life away. Mum kind of supported me in a way. She said there was no such word as can. Obviously, they're not very happy that I failed all my GCSEs. You know, they weren't happy about that. I just wanted to get out and work, Matt. I didn't want to do all this nonsense, you know? And so I, I moved into a bed, I moved out at 16, moved into a bed sit with my girlfriend in North Devon, 30 pound a week. Got evicted from three of them. Went through three bed sits in the same town. That was quite an achievement. And then into rental accommodation. I kept on putting this damn thing off, this business. I got a job at North Devon Legislature Center for working for £2.75 an hour as a lifeguard. That, that got me by, just about covered the bills. It was pretty painful. And in the end, it was my girlfriend at the time who said, you keep talking about this business thing. Because I had a thing that no one take me serious at 16. I'm too young. How's that? How am I going to start a business off? So I read somewhere, if you grow, if you look at the old pictures of me, I had like a long ponytail, it became like my... My symbol, I was worried if I had to cut the damn thing off, my success was going. It was like a lucky child. <laughs> yeah, like Steven Seagal type thing. I read somewhere, you look older if you grow your hair long. So I did that. And in the end, she bought me this briefcase. I think it's for Christmas or something, saying, come on, you keep talking about this business thing, just get on with it. Because probably you got in Devon, if you're a lifeguard, you've got loads of work in the summer. When it comes to winter, there's nothing there because it's tourism. So I still waited like six months. And then I opened up my first martial arts class. And for whatever reason, I knew... I had to be aggressive marketing wise. And I was very good at doing this flying kick. Um, obviously back then we didn't have like the paparazzi technology of pictures. So I, I had to go hire the squash court for like five pound. And I had to do many takes and get this kick right. And that became my logo in the end. Actually my brother, Nathan, drew my first, first logo for me using that flying kick. And then my posters made, put it all over the village. 
had 100 members paying me three pound a class and i was happy with that my, my costs were 15 pound a night for hall rent of a local school hall twice a week i was happy how long did it take to get those 100 members I opened up 100 members straight really? away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there weren't many people who were actually looking the part, doing it. And where I saw it as a negative at being so young, people saw it as positive. Because when people view you, they, they don't look at you. And it took me a while to figure this out. I think they're going to come to you because of how high you can kick or how good a shape you are. All they're interested in is that you need to represent what they want their child to become. And I did. I called them Sir Ma'am. I made sure I was very respectful and so forth. And... And the next chapter was is that one of my friends went to America on holiday, another martial artist, a guy called Lee Charles, a good friend of mine. And then he paged me back then. I started my business off of a pager. He said, and I went to the red phone box near my bed, sit, I called him up. And he said, Matt, I've just come back from the States and you don't believe what's going on out there. They're like 20 years ahead of us. There's like martial arts millionaires, multi-millionaires. There's conferences just about martial arts business. And... We're, we're kind of funny in our industry because I didn't want to compromise standards for money. I said, yeah, but I want to keep the standards high of, of Taekwondo. Because no, they got standards and they got the money. So I saved up my money working as, for £2.75 as a lifeguard and £3 a class as a martial arts instructor. And I flew out to a convention in the States and it was at a Hyatt Hotel, three-day convention. The owner of it was a guy in his 80s. He's not a martial artist, but he's like a business guru he owned a lot of the shares in Marriott Hotel, multi, multi-millionaire. I went and introduced myself to him. And America is very different to English. English, you're successful or have ambition, they just want to knock you down. In America, they, he was impressed I used my last money to buy a ticket to come to this convention. And he took me under his wing because I'd be like the perfect case study from our 17 then. And if he could make me rich and lead me on my way, it'd be a great case study for his, his consultancy organization. So... He told me, go and follow this person around. And I was getting up at four in the morning, going to all the staff trainings, watching their classes, understand how they market. And so take it back to England. If it works, it works. If it don't work, it don't work. I mean, they just see England as like a tiny little dot on the globe, don't they? Can you remember a couple of things that you learned back then which would have been utterly revolutionary to you that you thought Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like uh, um, put music on the lessons. Can't do that. I got kicked out of my martial arts organization because I was doing that not teaching in Korean. So we used to count in Korean and do the kicks in Korean, turn it to English. Um, making everything that the school system doesn't teach, designing the program so it does. So we teach goal setting, water safety, fire safety, uh, how to be, have good manners, be respectful. Topic of the month, they'll sit down with the kids at the end of each lesson for 10, 15 minutes, and the adults too. Give them homework sheets. They have to have a sheet signed by their parent, teacher, and martial arts instructor, and unless like, they're being well behaved and disciplined at school and at home and keeping their bedroom tidy, brushes on their teeth, then they're not allowed to go for the next color grade. The other thing I did too is I was the first guy to put people on direct debits in the UK for martial arts, which is a, seen as a no-no. Gyms were doing it. Uh, There's still some paid for gyms, like per class, and that stabilized my income. I went for 100 members who come as and when, pay me as and when to suddenly put them on 49, 59 pound a month membership, depending if they're family members or, or singles. And I was doing five, 6,000 pound a month, plus gradings, plus joining fees, merchandise, and my overheads were 30 pound a week. And you're still about 18 at this point? 17, yeah. And, and the next big dream was, I wanted to be like the American way. So the American way is big, bold centers, full-time locations. It's actually the wrong thing to do. That's not my business model, but I wanted to do that because that's all I felt they could do there. The, ne the next town was Barnstable, which was a population of 30,000. So I built this business of five, 6,000 a month with 10,000 people. So Barnstable got me excited and I wanted to have this building. And I saw the ideal building. It was above an estate agent, it's two floors, and it was owned by the estate agents. And I walked in there and they just laughed me out, man, like, you can't make any money out of cry. How are you 17? You're not even old enough to sign a lease. You know, I'm a laugh. Um, I, but I, I just saw, I saw the vision here. It was mapped out as offices. You just had to knock the partitions down. He had this ultimate dojo. And it, when it got bigger, I could expand it into the second floor. But I couldn't convince these, these guys called Richard and Len to, to let me have this studio. Um, but my mum was a conveyancing lawyer, a property lawyer. So she knew all the estate agents. So she called Richard Smith, who's owned this building, and said, listen, I think my son is onto something here. Why don't you give him six months free rent? Let him fund the partition knocking down. So there's no risk to you at all. 
you got nothing to lose. The market wasn't great back then. It's like talking like 97, 98 time. Let's see what happens. And they very reluctantly said, okay, we'll give you a six months free rent. The issue I had then is I wasn't old enough to sign a lease and my girlfriend was 19. She changed her name by Depot for, to Fides. And um, she signed the lease and we got in there. And I remember on New Year's Eve, and I was painting the walls, all the petitions were down. We couldn't afford mats or nothing. We had carpet down. There's a lot of carpet burn going on. My first round of students that they can remember, looking out the window, and it's right on the square in Barnsley on the front, where they do all the fireworks and celebrate New Year's Eve. And I saw the fireworks going off and everyone getting drunk and thinking, what am I doing here? What the hell am I doing? Surely I should be down there. But that's the, the moral of the story, really. You've got to observe the masses and do the opposite to everyone else. Long story short, six months later, 700 members, making a million pound a year, 80,000 a month from that building. And it was the biggest martial arts school in the UK. And I duplicated that five times. How were you marketing it? I, back then it was all offline. There was no online, there was no Facebook, internet was around, email was around, but it wasn't a thing. So I spent 140 pound on a little advert. Literally a picture of me doing my flying kit, full-time martial arts school at Barnstable. And I had a queue all around the corner, people just coming to sign up. No one was doing martial arts professionally as a business. They were all doing it for fighting and or as an educational system. And word got around like this. You've got this guy in town who's doing, it's like a private school, what he's doing. They've got homework. The kids have looked after and he looks the part and, and so on. You know, it's like, it's like when you see these personal trainers out there. Now, a lot of them are out of shape for these big chains. You think, what are you doing? How can you take advice to someone who hasn't done it himself? And I left the part. So I, I, I always knew that marketing was the number one thing. And I read all the right books, you know, Tony Robbins' books and Robert Kiyosaki's with his dad, poor dad, and Jay Abraham's marketing books. I mean, what, what got you into those books? What opened you up to that world? I mean, it was, was that off the back of when you'd gone to the, the, American, Americans. the American thing? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, the Americans are just like, you can be as great as martial arts instructor in the world, but no one's going to go and say, oh, that was a great class. Here's a check for £10,000. Ain't going to happen. It's all about how you get those members in the front doors, what brings you success, and then delivering the service. And this is where people go wrong. They focus too much on the service and don't understand the front end. They got to have, there's three areas of business. You've got the marketing down, the sales down, and then you get to do what you do, the service, the service part. And I just knew from the outset, I had incredible mentors at such a young age, that I had to get this marketing thing down. So by the 5th of every month, I had 15 marketing ideas already strategized and planned in my diary, ready to execute the following month. So every month there was 15 offline activities. In fact, that's still in place now. So my franchisees now, they have to have 15 marketing ideas in place offline by the 5th of every month, aside from Facebook and social media too. 15 new ones every month? Every single month, yeah. And, and what, what would some examples be? So if you look at this time of year, we're at Easter now, so it would be like um, an Easter camp campaign, okay. bring a friend to class, school talks, assembly, parents night out, uh, leaflet drops, putting posters in all the places like GPs, doctors, dentists, surgeries, having 100 lists, 100 places where people can visibly see you, lead boxes, yeah, go, go on and on. And um, back in the day when, when you were doing this, you, you got to your five studios, I mean, even when you'd done one, to be fair, I mean, what were the competition saying? They hated me. Like, what the hell, you can't do this? What the hell do you think you are making money out of martial arts? You can't put music on the lessons. I mean, I was the most hated man in the martial arts industry. They compared me to McDonald's. They thought I watered it all down. They called it McDojo. But now they're all doing it. Now they're all trying to be like me, you know? Well, they'll never be like me. It's like Arnold's scores taker and say, that, oh, we don't want to look like you, Arnold. Say, don't worry, you never will. They're not going to catch us because we were the first and we're the biggest and, and we're still out there. But now they understand it and they embrace what I was about. But back then, I took a lot of hate. I did, for the sector. And even like growing up, I used to buy a martial arts magazine called Martial Arts Illustrated. And I cycle, cycle my BMX bike with my pocket money and buy that and read it every single month. And my goal was one day to be in it. And I was, other than Bruce Lee, the editor tells me I was the most featured person on the front cover of Martial Arts Illustrated. Because they knew, they put Matt Finesse on the front it was going to sell copies and all my thousands and thousands of students are going to buy it. We, and it was we, controversial. Were you still training hard yourself at this point with like the martial arts? Okay, yeah. so you, you didn't kind of get chubby and move to business. You were, you, you were doing both sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I put my training first and even when I started having kids and stuff, I'd get in and go train at 9.30 at night for an hour and 
still still want to be progressing. Those things are very linked together. And to get on the front cover of that magazine, I know it sounds ridiculous, but the editor wanted to me to spar him, fight him. So I went up to Huddersfield, proper old school, and I had to spar him to show him I was a real deal. And uh, at the end of it, he beat the hell out of me. He's got like ninth down and 10 martial arts. And he's like, okay, yeah, you can be on the front cover. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Bob laughs about it now. Um, but yeah, it was an incredible, incredible journey. And everyone who's anyone in the martial arts world will come in down to Devon to try and check out what the hell is this 18-year-old doing? How is he making all this money? Why has he got a Ferrari 355 at 18 years old? Uh, what's he doing different to us when we've been doing this 30 years and we've never made this kind of... They still got day jobs. Martial arts is just a hobby to them. You know, he must be doing something criminal. So it can't be right. But now I just modernised the martial arts industry. And when did you start to franchise it? Okay, so this is where the story goes a bit wild. So the next town, the reason I stopped at five is you've got Barnsville, Biddeford, Ilfracombe, South Moulton, etc., Bronson. The next town was 40 miles away, a place called Tiverton. And in my head, I felt it's hard enough getting people to work for an 18-year-old when they're in their 30s, 40s, let alone travel to Tiverton. So that was a mental block for me. I didn't think it was going to be able to happen. Now, I sat in my reception of my main martial arts school, my full-time centre in Barnstable, and one of the parents is a reporter. He had two students, a boy and a girl, come to my, my school. And he said, Matt, I work for Southwest News Agency. I didn't, didn't mean anything to me at the time. I like to do a story on you. I'm a journalist. I know you're bullied at school. You've got no qualifications. You're clearly making a lot of money. And you've got a nice car outside. Can I interview you? And I was like, sure. I was looking for significance recognition after being bullied at school. I was, just what I wanted, you know. So he interviewed me. He wanted a picture of me when I was at school, but when I was the bullied boy age in my school picture, seven years old. And then he took me through my whole childhood, what I was doing, how things are going now. And I was very honest, Matt, about the money I was earning because all these people would try and hide it. I parked my Ferrari right outside the building because his parents said, God, you must make a lot of money out of this. I'm like, yeah, that's why you bring your kid to me because I'm going to teach you everything that the school system don't teach you. So they can have a fry one day. Wouldn't that be great? And parents are like, yeah. You know, if I tried to park it around the corner and hide my success, then it would have had the same effect. So this guy who's called Nick Constable did a big feature on me and took a picture of me in my car, me doing a martial arts pose, went away, nothing happened for a few days. And this is back in 97, 98, when mainstream media was massive. Like each publication, we picked up 20 million copies per day. And yeah, I woke up one morning, the phone was ringing off to hurt the landline. It was just going mad. And I thought, what the hell is going on? And I went to get some food and everyone was staring at me and pointing at me. I was on the front page of every single tabloid newspaper that was, Bully Boy Becomes Millionaire. And it's such a unique story with martial arts. It, it was massive. And then on the back of that, TV researchers, they scan the newspaper for stories. So you probably remember the, the, the shows like Esther Ramson, Trisha, Kilroy, yeah. Richard and Judy, GMTV. I did all the shows. And on the back of that, Yuri Geller was watching, the world famous... Mind power, spoon, spoon bender, bender, they call him in the UK, but then the rest of the world don't call him that. Yuri Geller was watching it, he was hugely successful, especially in property and business. And his best friend was Michael Jackson. He introduced me to Michael Jackson as we became friends and he got to trust me. And Michael was already a black belt. Joseph Jackson made all the Jackson Five study martial arts. He wanted to proceed with his training as a second down. And just a conversation in his hotel suite bored we couldn't go anywhere michael says to me how's your business doing i've got five locations uh, why you only got five locations matt why don't you took this in global i said well the next town's at tiverton is 40 miles away and i gave him this sob story he's like what are you, what are you talking about I, I i'm a poor boy from gary indiana what i'm nine children with no money whatsoever got the biggest selling album in the world Phil, have you ever heard of it and uh, of course you can work out how to get this thing to this, this town so it's called franchising. And I immediately bit back at Michael and said, yeah, but no one's ever done that in martial arts before. And he said, well, that's exactly why you got to do it. And he took out a napkin or like a notepad from the, it was a Renaissance hotel in Higher Holborn in London. And he wrote down everything I needed to do because he was a master at licensing his name. He had the biggest brand deal with Pepsi Cola of all time, endorsement deal. And he, he wrote down, you've got to manualize everything, you've got a script, you've got to be genius for manip manipulating mainstream media, you've got to systemize everything, you've got to build a brand. Yeah, and then from that point onwards, my friendship with Michael became very different. So yeah, I took over, I was bodyguard to him, I took over his security, but I did it for free. There's no money exchange. I didn't want his money. I was already a millionaire before I met the guy. I didn't want his money. 
And that's why the friendship worked for 10 years. But he kept me well, accountable. Well, I tell you what, I was going to say, we, we, we've, we've taught Yuri Geller, Michael Jackson and, and Bodyguard in about 30 seconds. Let, let's, let, let's, let's rewind a second just to sure. finish off on franchising and then we can get, to, get to deep on the Michael Jackson stuff. But so, um, but so it was when you knew Michael that he introduced, that he introduced you the concept of franchising yeah. and then you just, you just went, went back to England and, uh, and decided to give it a whirl. It was in London. Michael Jackson opened my mind to that anything is possible. And Yuri Geller as well. So Yuri's like, stop flipping, wasting your car, money on Ferraris, Matt. Buy houses, they're not building any more land. It's a great investment in the world. So he pushed me. I hated him for it. I hated Yuri for it. I love him for it now. We've got the largest property portfolio in the southwest of the UK. Um, Michael, on the other hand, kept me accountable on building this franchise network. So whenever the phone calls took place, whenever he called me up, it changed. It was, how's the business going, Matt? When we, we used to get meetups, and well, my, my, my friend network was unbelievable. Like Muhammad Al Fayed, we used to go around his house for dinner, and the owner of Harrods. And the conversation at the dinner table was very different to an average 18, 19, 20 year old. What I was experiencing, I was with billionaires and superstars, and, and um, they just held me accountable. And what was the concept of the franchise? So I, I'm a, I'm a local karate owner. I don't know anything about business. I come and buy the you know the the MF karate yeah, MF martial arts package and um, and and you teach me a business in a box and business in a box. Yeah. Do you know what? It's nowadays you don't get martial artists buying them. We get investors buying them because the return's so good. You think about it, it's just an empty room. It's a school hall. So the full time American model, full time center, that doesn't really work in the UK. There's no need for that. You just hire locations for 10, 15 pound an hour. So, and also it's VAT exempt because it's education as well. We had to fight for that. And so now we get investors. They buy one for 10, 25 grand and they get an 85% return on their money, passive income, and they just employ martial arts instructors. And, and is, it, is it just the, the sign on food? Do they pay you like an, an ongoing commission as well? They pay me a commission. So that I only make money if they make money. So win win. And that's always seen me good. Rather than some franchises just pay you a set amount, that's the way it's worked. And people have tried to copy it and stuff, but it's never worked out because you can't copy my story. You can't copy my social proof. You know, when you, when you stick, if, if you're looking for your, to take your child to a martial arts class or for you to join martial arts class, you put my name in Google, you get a long list of media articles going back 20 odd years and social proof. You put the competitors trying to copy what I do. You just get a website, an Instagram, a TikTok, or account you're always going to pick the person who's been around nearly three decades with all these mega stars and advising kim kardashian and stuff over the local guy people want to be part of a brand so people are happy to buy into a brand and, and they they especially now where people are concerned about pedophiles and and are their children safe and the internet stuff we even cover that internet bullying cyber safety now too so yeah, the brand power is, is, is really, really important. And how many have you got? How many units? 1,800 now. All around the world? All, all around the world. We're expanding. We're about to go on our biggest expansion ever. We're going to do 2,000 more locations. Um, but big time in Australia, obviously UK, Ireland, and, and so forth. And do, you still, do you still have the original five? Yeah. Yeah, I've still got the original building. Which yeah. I, yeah, 27 years later. Which Yeah, I go in there sometimes and I think back to... I was decorating it and how the hell did this happen, you know? And, and they love it when I go. It's funny because that town gave me such a hard time. And when I go back now, they're like, thanks for putting Barnstable on the map. You know, if, you, if it weren't for you, you brought Michael Jackson here, you brought this here. And I was thinking, yeah, you guys gave me such a hard time, man. I was like the most hated person in North Devon. But I don't blame them. Now I'm 44 and I look back at it. When you're 18 years old and you're driving around town in perfect condition, your body perfect, long hair, permed, with, in a Ferrari 355 Spider with the roof down in the winter, multi-millionaire, and your best friends are Michael Jackson, Yuri Geller, Britney Spears, and, and Mohammed Al-Fad, people are going to think you're not normal. And you're not from that town as well. So I get it now. But um, yeah, I, you've got to put up a lot of hate to be successful. Well, look, let's um, let's move from business to to Michael Jackson. And obviously, that was one of the two key things we we talk about at the beginning. And uh, obviously, what you what you're well known for. You've you've quickly glossed over the fact that when you started to get well known, you met Yuri Geller, and and Yuri Geller then introduced you to Michael. I mean, just 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 tell us a bit more around that story, because I mean, even though you're a you know successful young guy at, at the time, uh, it still must have been a, a, a bit of a su surprise to walk into the room with probably you know, what was and still is one of the, if not the most famous men in the world. Yeah. Well, he, the last award he got was Guinness Book of Records, the most famous man in the world. 
But no, Yuri Geller called me at three o'clock in the morning, said, come to my house now. If you don't, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Uh, it's the problem I had, he wouldn't tell me why. He would not tell me why. And he lived in Sondon on Thames, just outside of Reading in England. So it's about three and a half hours from me. C credible house, like a replica of the White House. 20 million pound mansion with all the ground and buildings attached next to George Clooney's house. So I said, Yuri, can you just tell me why? So I, look, I've never guided you wrong. Get in your Ferrari, stop moaning. I love you, bye. Put the phone down me. So I had a massive row with my missus, as you could imagine. What the hell you could try and explain where you're going and three o'clock in the morning. And I arrive at Yuri's house, the gates open as they do, and it's a like, incredible home, and walk in this living room, and yeah, this guy walks up to me, and he bows to me, he says, hi, Master Fides, my name is Michael Jackson, pleased to meet you. And I thought, flipping heck, I know you are, but what are you doing here? And then for a second, I thought, I'm quite high profile on all these shows. It's a prank TV show, like Jeremy Beadle or something like that, you know. And I know Yuri Geller was very powerful, internationally famous, and I'd hear presidents ring, and, and royal, royalty, and big names would be there, but... Not to this level. I never heard him mention Michael Jackson. It turns out it's his best mate, best man at his wedding. And we got like a house on fire. Me and Michael just got on so well. Just talk about Yuri, because I mean, I think for people, he's still alive, Yuri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's got, living in his round Yuri Geller Museum. But I think for people, uh, I guess, who, who are, let's say, younger than us, it's not really a name that people know now. But I mean, you know, going back to certainly you know, the 80s and 90s, I mean, the, the guy was enormous. Like you say, he was known as, um, I guess, the spoon bender and, and, and that he had some money, some international connections. But I, I don't think people appreciate, you know, the quantum of wealth, you know, the, the, the amount of power. I mean, where, where did it all come from? So, yeah, so um, he's got companies all around the world. When you're world famous, you just release one book and it does moder modestly okay with a publisher. He's translated in all those different languages. I think he's published like 52 books and he's got production. Uh, about my, about my mind stuff. power, mind medicine, yeah, what, creating wealth and health and, and so forth, you know, autobiographies. There's, there's loads of books that he's done and co written. And then he's got TV shows all around the world. You, he used to say to me about the UK, he said, Matt, you can never be a prophet in your hometown. So in the UK, it's just spoon bent. When you go around the world of you, you get it, there's none of that. Uh, it's, it's more about the mind side. So you've got like Tony Robbins. I was about to say, you, 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 as, walk. as I'm listening to this, he's, he's basically sounding yeah. like a, a Tony Robbins yeah. with a, with a, who can do a few magic tricks, if you like. Yeah, I don't know if it's, I, I've seen that spoon thing, fork thing, metal thing, pound coin. If it's magic, then it's, it's damn good because he literally just rubs it, hands it to you, and it bends in your hand. So, I don't know. I see him doing <laughs> swimming pools, every kind of theory. I thought, is it a chemical? Is it this? But I can't. I've known that guy since I was 17 now, and I'm 44. He's my best friend, and uh, I don't know how he does it. I've got no idea. And I've seen it probably more than many, many people. But no, he's been investigated by scientists and everything. But no, he's got TV shows all around the world called The Next Yuri Geller, where people are trying to audition to, in front of him to be the next Yuri Geller. And in the UK, he's just never been given that kind of recognition. So you meet Michael, um, middle of the night. You miss it. You, your missus is pissed off with you. You've, uh... Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you try to tell her why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Where are you? Oh, I'm just hanging out with Michael Jackson, the singer. And, yeah. and and you so you went to meet him because you really wanted to introduce you because he he's a, he was a martial arts uh, practitioner himself. So so Michael Jackson was martial arts black belt. And was, was that was that common knowledge? I mean I mean I've never well, heard that before. Yeah, you, you can't imagine it, Michael Jackson I, as a martial artist. I know, he was damn good. Not just him though. Tito, Jermaine, all of them did it. All the Jacksons. Joseph made sure they wanted make sure they could take care of himself. Joseph was a boxer. Their dad. They call him Joseph, by the way. They don't call him Dad. That's why I refer to him as Joseph. And um, yeah, it's, it's common. You know, you look back at Michael Jackson's dance and he puts all the kicks and punches and yeah. blocks in his dance and it's all in there. He was a Bruce Lee fanatic. You sit down with Michael and watch a movie, he, he would annoy you because he'd know every single word to enter the dragon, where the dragon, the big boss. No matter how many times he just watched the movies over and over again. And he wanted to meet Shannon Lee and Lyndon Lee. Linda Lee, Bruce Lee's ex-wife and only surviving child, his daughter. Um, because he, that's what he did. He studied the greats and wanted to know how they stay relevant. And I had connections to Shannon Lee and Linda Lee. So he was obsessed about what made Bruce Lee so relevant all these years on. So he was studying like James Brown, Charlie Chaplin, Fred Astaire and, and take bits from them and put them into his own dance and his, his thinking. Read four or five non-fiction books per week. If we go to bookshops, he just cleaned the whole place out, literally. 
Uh, well, actually, one time we went to London. We, we were running late for our flight. And it was a particular bookshop. And it specialised in art because he's an artist as well. And I, I said, I went up to him. And in public, I referred to him as Mr. Jackson. I said, oh, Mr. Jackson, we, we need to get going, you know. And he goes, hmm, damn, I love this bookshop too. Okay, can you just tell her I'll take all of it? I said, what do you mean? I said, I, I, we'll just take everything. So Michael, I'm not, I'm not going up to that cashier in town. You can take the whole thing. So okay, I'll do it. And he goes, he goes, he goes up to her and goes, hi. He said, um, I got a cash of flight apparently. Can I take everything? And you can send it to Neverland and, <laughs> and uh, my team will take care of the bill. Thank you, bye. And, he, and, he, and they shut the door down on the shop that day. And it all got exported. Every single book got exported to Neverland. <laughs> it was insane. So he would just like study. He was Tony Robbins. He was really into him. Tony talks about him in his personal power uh, kit about that Michael had the biggest endorsement deal of all time with Pepsi Cola. He was the, the man who started off celebrity endorsements and licensing. So for him, he was a big inspiration to me. I mean, he took me under his wing. And so was Michael, I mean, I, I guess you're going to say yes because of some of the things you've already been saying. But so, I mean, was, was Michael an intelligent guy, a businessman who was in control of his own stuff? Because, I mean, again, as um, I guess as, as a lay public, you know, we always look at people like that and we think, oh, incredibly talented performer, but, you know, surrounded by these management team, these lawyers, these, you know, these, these deal makers and, and, and they just you know, put him in a room and, and he gets on with it, but they create all the stuff. I mean, was, was Michael, you know, very much the creator of his own destiny? He, he was the creator of his own destiny, but he was very bad in trusting the wrong people. So for the 10 years I knew him, he must have gone through 12 different managers and some of them were very good and some of them were very bad. He, if they were very good, why was he going through them? Because people would get in his ear. The, late, the latest friend, the latest... I won't say family member because he didn't have an awful lot to do with, with them as such. But people would get in his ear about this or that and, and he would push the next person out. And even myself, I would find myself pushed out at some point. But, but why, why could, he, you know, if he's an intelligent guy, you know, and, and he, he can read a room and he can see circumstances, you know, why could he not make those decisions himself? Like, and you see it a lot, I don't know, um, you know, guy, guy gets a new girl, you know, older guy, younger girl, she, she, she wants to get her feet under the table and he's, he's pussy whipped and, start, and starts to basically, you know, cast aside everyone, everyone who's, who's been near him. But I guess it, it's never a decision made by, by sense it. It, it's, yeah. you know, it, it's, a, it's a guy following his dick who wakes up five years yeah. later and thinks, you know, what the fuck have I done? Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I mean w w was that a kind of a similar, I mean, I'm not saying it's, he's, I, he's doing it to women because of women, but you know, if he's an intelligent guy who's had good people around him, why does he listen to someone to then kick out these good people? The, the biggest issue we had was the doctors. There was always a doctor. And I, I ain't joking. I, I remember one time I went into a bathroom of a hotel downstairs, not in Michael's hotel suite. And I could overhear a doctor talking to a Michael Jackson fan. And the doctor was basically doing a 10,000 pound deal which was a lot of money back then, to introduce the fan to Michael in the hotel suite. I couldn't believe my ears. Problem I had is that go, if you go back to Michael with that, you've got to hope he's going to believe you because he'll shut you out. And then he's stuck with this doctor who, who's no good for him. And this is the issue we had. The doctors had a way of hooking Michael in with the medication. And so, making him dependent on them. So let's talk about doctors. So why did he have these doctors? You know, what were they for? What was the medication? What was the dependency? Well, he, he, um, he got burnt with a Pepsi Cola commercial. Serious scalp burn. I remember that. Yeah. And he was, because he's Michael Jackson, they over-prescribed him, in my belief. And, and but that's when it all began. There, there, there was began. no drugs. There was no doctors no. prior to this. No. That guy would never try. He, and he given to a doctor by a doctor he saw as medicine. I mean, he was, I know it's hard for people to understand this because the way he died, but he would not let me go to nightclubs. I was not allowed to drink alcohol. I had my first alcoholic drink until I was 27. That's how tough he was on us. Because when he said, when he was getting famous with the Jackson 5, he'd go around these clubs at five, seven, eight years old and see the way guys would treat women and alcohol abuse and drug abuse. And he was really tough on us about that. If you, if you ever smoke, Matt, you're out. If you ever see you drinking alcohol, you're out. He was pretty full on. But the doctor side, he had this, this well publicized now, dependency on painkillers. You know, it's not like paracetamol you, you get over here. It's over there, it's like heroin, opium, opium linked painkillers. And the damn doctors would give it to him because it's a way 
of them staying in his life. And we'd get rid of one doctor and another one would turn up. It was just a constant cycle. And that but was Is that all he was having, these, these painkillers? Yeah, sleeping tablets. Like, um, if I'm honest with you, obviously I know what he died of because that's been in the autopsy. At the time, I didn't know what he was taking. I was a guy in my 20s, mid 20s to late 20s, seeing my friend go into a room and then come out 20 minutes later like a flipping zombie or be a bit erratic. I didn't know what the hell he was taking. It was all double Dutch to me. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously I, I, when he died, he died of zendapines and... I remember we used to you know, see all the Michael Jackson stories like, oh, you know, he, he's, he's got his doctors on 24-7 call. He, he, he sleeps in an oxygen tent. He does this, he does the other. I mean, I mean were, were these other things true as well? He designed all those stories. So the oxygen chamber one is um, his first bash of controlling the media. So he was very much a close friend of Elizabeth Taylor. He admired Elizabeth Taylor and used to speak to her all the time. And she used to get on a magazine called the National Enquirer, oh, yeah. which was massive back then. And Michael was jealous of her because he wanted to be on the National Enquirer on the front. That was the thing. You don't want to be on the front of the National Enquirer now, but that was the thing. And he, after the burn that he had, the serious burn situation, obviously Pepsi Cola thought he was going to sue them because a, py a pyrotechnic went off and burned his hair. Rather than do that, Michael made them donate a lot of money to a burn center for children. And he visited it. And he turned up there, and there was this oxygen chamber there, which basically kids go in, and it helps their skin get better quicker. Some kind of latest technology. And he thought to himself, hmm. He said to his manager, Frank DeLeo, I'm going to get in that quickly, take a quick picture of me, and we're going to release that. So he led down on it. He said it was the most scariest thing of his life. Frank DeLeo, his manager, took a picture of him of it, and he said, send that to the National Enquirer and tell them I sleep in an oxygen chamber. He did, boom, front page. That was it. And that story stuck ever since. And then he had like the elephant man bones and all the classic stories you can think of. He started to realize he can manipulate mainstream media extremely well, and make billions off the back of it. And his record sales would go through the roof and create the mystique that became Michael Jackson, which also backfired on him too. So tell me, so you became friends, um, as well as being friends, you, you would do security for him as yeah. well. Uh, I mean, was that an, an ad hoc now and again, like when he needed something special or, or did, you, did you have a, an official capacity? No, I wasn't employed. I wasn't paid. I did, he offered me money, but I didn't want his money. I've got my own businesses to run. Um, so yeah, he would just call me and say, I'm at the airport. I'm about to fly to England. Can you, can you meet me at Terminal 5 Heathrow? Pick me up come hang out with me, or I'm at Paris, or I'm in New York, can you come hang out on board? And because um, I was a martial arts guy, and back then I had big muscles, and I was, you know, I'm a six foot four, and he's my little vulnerable friend, I would, I would naturally be very protective of my mate. Because when he get out, he would get absolutely mullered, mobbed, everywhere we went, we just couldn't do anything. You know, and, and that became a thing, and also paparazzi was a big thing back then, so pictures of me and him would be everywhere. And yeah, so it's an unofficial role, I saw bodyguard companies charging 150, 200,000 a month. And he could answer phone calls around them, I think, because they would sell them out, sell stories. So I said, stop all this nonsense. If you, if you need me for public events, I've got hundreds of martial artists linked to me, instructors. I've got my family. My brother-in-law used to do the bodyguard and outside his bedroom door, out to his hotel suites and things. You can trust in us, just call on us whenever you want. And he did. And presumably they all got paid. So... My team did not get paid. My brother-in-law, I believe, got paid for the night shift. Yeah, standing outside his door. In fact, he probably had more communication with Michael than all of us because Michael famously couldn't sleep. And I uh, used to come out wandering the corridors on the night and with my brother-in-law and chatting to him and stuff about everything and things. But yeah, they, they got paid. But uh, I, didn't know, I didn't want money off Michael. I got paid by Michael by the network, the contact book, the... The, the knowledge that he had been passed on to me. Well, I think that's what I was going to come on to. That, you know, um, whilst, whilst you may have not been paid in money, you know, to, to be to be uh, you know in proximity to someone like that, you know, with, with his network, with his contact base, you know, with, with the with the pull and reach he's got, uh, you know, wh wh whether it was spoken or unspoken. I mean, that 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 had to have been, I guess, a, a massive attract a massive attractor to you. That you know, and it's not. Yeah, you know, I always can never find my words properly on these kind of situations. Really, I think you know just because somebody has something that you can benefit from, you know, you can still be mates. It, it, doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be disingenuous. No. Like if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're mates together, we're mates together. But if I know you know someone, 
I'm going to ask you for an introduction. I'm going to ask you if, if you can help, and in the same way, in the same way, I do the same for you. It's not that's not why I'm your mate. Yeah. Um, and I know you know some, some people might think there's a fine line, but I also think that you know sensible or intelligent people can always tell when someone's trying to build a relationship with them from you know from a bad place or from 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 some disingenuous intent. He, he understood very well because he said to me, "If you're going to be friends with me, Matt, your life's never going to be the same." And I I just laughed off at the beginning. It was almost like a like a schoolboy asking if he could be friends with you at school. You know, are you sure you want to be my friend? I didn't understand what he meant. But fripping heck, it's life changing. There's a day that goes past even now where someone stops me or asks me or a DM comes in about Michael. And uh, 15 years after his death, it's, it seems to be getting bigger. And they've got the biopic coming out next year. The same people who have made the Freddie Mercury one are currently filming the Michael Jackson one. It's called Michael and his nephew, Jafar, Jermaine's son's playing him. He'll be. He'll be they reckon it's gonna be the biggest movie of all time. I don't doubt it. You were you were friends with him up until up until his death. Yeah, I spoke to him two nights before he died. He called me up erratic, unhappy, and I was. I knew something was wrong. I didn't think he was gonna die. If I thought he was gonna die, I would have been on the next plane out. He asked me to fly out. He, he called up. I was in Barnstable. My wife answered the phone, and she said, oh, "Michael's on the phone. It doesn't sound good." I spoke to him, and he was very erratic in his speech. I said, "What the hell?" you've been taking. He said, oh, the doctor's given me a drug to help me perform, rehearse that night. So he said to me, the concert promoters were going to pull the concerts. So it's 50 shows in the O2 arena. I had tickets, I remember. Oh, did you? I did, yeah. Yeah. And they, he, he had this thing about rehearsing. He said, Matt, I've been, I wrote these songs, I wrote the dances, I've been doing this for 30 odd years. I, I don't need to be rehearsing every night at the Staples Centre. But I've got to go tonight although they're going to pull the show and that they advanced him a load of money apparently and they were, he was living off them. The accommodation, I wasn't doing the security. I had very hard to get hold of Michael at this point because they took over complete control of him the last two, the last couple of years. And then, um, yeah, he, he got my number for, for someone who was at the house at the time. And he said, I need to get hold of Joseph. I said, and his dad. So Joseph Jackson is the only person that can sort this shit out. That's the exact words to me. And I was like, whoa, because if Michael calls you asking for Joseph, you know there's something not quite good because they didn't quite well publicised. They never had the greatest relationship. It was better towards the end of his life. So I knew where his dad was. I had his number. He's in Las Vegas. Michael was in Los Angeles at the time. So I gave him his dad, Joseph Jackson's number. And then he asked for his best friend, Mark Lester's number. Now, Mark Lester played the original Oliver Twist. Remember that film? I mean, I know. Please, I know, sir, I know, have yeah. some more. He's the original one. They're the same age. They grew up in the magazines together, the Jackson Five, and they, oh, that was his best mate. Mark was godfather to Michael Jackson's children, and Michael Jackson's godfather to Mark Lesser's children. So I gave him Mark's number too. He then asked to speak to my children. He spoke to Madison, my oldest daughter. Um, then he spoke to Lola, my second daughter. He tried to speak to Lola. She was only like a toddler at the time. Uh, came back to me, and I said, are you sure you're okay? Because I'm fine. I'm on the way to rehearse. So you make sure you ring Joseph. said, I will. And I'll see you in London in the next few weeks. So I'll see you there, man. We've got the house ready. We're going to move in with you, me and Mark Lester are. And the plan was my family was going to move in with him and Mark Lester's family going to move in with him. And rather than stay in a hotel suite and be stuck in a hotel suite for nine months, he hired a house in Surrey, funny enough, between Surrey and Kent. And the plan was to get on the River Thames and get to the O2 Arena so we don't have the paparazzi following the kids and him all the time. And we were going to make sure he ate, slept, keep the doctors away and so forth. And that was that. So I left him. I was... He took a drug called ephedrine, he said, which is not abnormal for a dancer to take or a bodybuilder to take before you work out. It's quite a... And he, I thought if the doctor gave it to him, then it was okay. Anyway, it turned out he did the most incredible performance ever that night. He blown them away. Billy Jean, everything, just blew them apart and came away and the concert promoters were like, yes, we, we're, we, he's going to do it. He's going to smash out the O2 Arena. And he went home, and on the Thursday, I came home from the office, sat down on the sofa, put the TV on, sat down with Madison on my lap. Yuri Geller calls me up and says, uh, I got Fox News on the phone at CNN, saying that Michael's in a coma. I was like, Yuri, you know what he's like with the publicity stunts. He's fine, I spoke to him two nights ago. He's a bit unhappy about the way he's been treated out there, he rehearsed too hard, but he's fine. He's got a doctor looking after him as well. He goes, okay. It's just Michael B. Michael hyping up the the, um, the the show that's coming to him. And about an hour later, Yuri calls me again. It's Matt. I'm driving down the driveway to my house. 
My landlines are going mad. We've got CNN, Fox News, Larry King, everyone saying that Michael's had a heart attack. I was like, God, should I ring Michael or should I not? Because the amount of times I rang him, Matt, and he's, he's like, ha you, you fell into my trap, Matt. It's a publicity stunt. And it's just too good to be true. It's, this can't be right. It's, it's right next to his show, you know? Even all the tickets were sold out. Come off the phone to Yuri, Mark Lester rings me. Now, when I saw Mark ringing me, I thought, shit, there's it's some truth to this. Because Mark's a different route to Michael. He's closer to Michael than me. So he speaks to the nanny. And the nanny was screaming down the phone, Michael's dead, Michael's dead, and so on. So he said, where are you? So I'm at home. So Matt, listen, um, Michael's died. I was like, wow. I said, well, how? I said, we don't know. But the nanny's screaming down the phone, he's dead, he's gone. And anyway, it took hours for anything that had gone on the news. And by that point, I had his family ringing me up. Are you with my brother? Are you with Michael? I said, no. So I, there's rumors that he's not very well. He's been rushed to the hospital. And I just played dumb because I didn't want to be the one to deliver the news. I said, call your mum, you know, and I knew he'd already died by that point. And uh, yeah, but, but about two hours later, I went on the TV, Michael Jackson, the coma, Mike Jackson's heart attack. And then once they, no one wanted to say it. And once they got the official coroner's report, Michael Jackson dead. And then that was it. It was freaking mayhem. Helicopters over the house. It was like a couple of days of absolute madness and, and how, how, how did you take it? How did it hit you? Real hard. Real hard. Yeah. You can't, like, when you breathe somebody, you go for a process, you have counselling. And so I went to the doctors. And I said, you imagine it. You know, you sit down. My friend has died. Who's your friend? They, they, they knew who my friend was. because got well known. They didn't know what to deal with me. Everywhere I went, his music was playing like never before. The shows he wanted commissioned when he was alive were suddenly being commissioned, like Thrill Alive in London and and so on, musicals, everything was happening. Everyone wanted to know why he died. And it was everywhere, Sky News, Top News. It was madness, paparazzi outside my house. I was getting treated like I was him. And you, Mark Lester was too, and Yuri was. We were getting hounded. We just couldn't cope. Doctors put me on antidepressants, sleeping tablets. They sent me to a bereavement counselor. I imagine I had a brand new Ferrari 360 Spider at the time, turning up, going in there for counseling. And if she doesn't know how to deal with the situation, she starts crying. I end up giving her a hug because it's such an unusual thing. They're fascinated by it. But yeah, it was tough. We all had to have therapy and, and uh, learn to embrace it. And I think what annoyed me the most is that I went from being Matt Fidesz to martial arts millionaire, property tycoon, businessman. As soon as he died, ever since, and I've learned to live with it now, and I, 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 I wear it, I embrace it, just got labeled as Michael Jackson's bodyguard. But he warned me of that. He did say, didn't he? But your life's never going to be the same. So, but yeah, but that's the same. I know Alfred Presley's bodyguard very well. It's the same with him too. He gets labelled that, and he's got some great credentials to his name. Well, look, we can't talk about Michael uh, without, um, you know, without talking about uh, you know the, the the child abuse allegations. And sure. uh, I mean, I mean, you know, they were they were multiple and frequent and uh, over over a long period of time. And I guess you know, and, and if anyone was going to be close to and witness that kind of thing or, or comment on it, it's going to be yourself. Um, I mean, I, I guess uh, from a, again, from a, a lay person's perspective, uh, you know, I, it's, it's framing the question, but I mean, it, it's always hard for, I think for us, even though we know we don't know what goes on the other, on the other side of the wall, you know, I would say, you know, there's no smoke without fire. You know, it's one thing when one person says it when it's going on dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and and even things when you, you know which were I think known facts like you know you'd have all the kids around the house or people would yeah. sleep in the bed and stuff. I mean, even if he wasn't abusing them, you know, as a parent, it's fucking bonkers. I yeah. Mean, I mean, what what's what what's uh, yeah yeah sure to talk about. If you didn't ask the question, then people would be asking, why are you dodging that question? So it all goes back to the 1993 allegations by Jordan Chandler. His dad was a dentist, Evan Chandler. Um, I encourage people to go and watch a documentary out there called Square One on Amazon Prime, and another one called Chase the Truth, which goes in deep into this subject. So in 1993, Michael was in the middle of a big tour called the Dangerous Tour. Billions were at stake, hundreds of employees, two 747 Jets going around the world, massive. Had to be interrupted because this boy made these allegations. The same family, Evan Chandler, came to, to Michael with a finance proposal to budget, to, to make a film. He made a film called Men, Men in Tights. He wanted to make a big budget film. Michael declined the offer. And then the guy went away 
And I don't know why it's not more out there, but you do see this a lot now where people just, the mainstream media don't seem to want to report it. They want to report the narrative. There's audio tapes. You go watch these documentaries where Evan Chandler says, if I go through this, I'm going to win big time. You know, we're going to get Michael Jackson. We're going to stitch him up. And it's all over money. I don't know. You got kids, Matt? Yes. Yeah, I got six kids. Someone accused, someone, one of my kids said to me, Daddy, you know, Michael Jackson molested me. Anyone molested with me, I'll, I'll, I'll kill him. Yeah. I will kill him. I'm not, I'm not going to go and sue them for money. My first phone call, well, but first I'll go and get a gun probably, then call the police. I'm not having that. So they just went and sued for money. They were not interested in the criminal side. So they sued for money against Michael Jackson. And then the district attorney, the, the police, basically, FBI, they approached and said, well, don't you want to file a criminal suit? No, we're not interested in that. We just want to go for the money. And the story goes basically that Jordan Chandler was given some kind of a um, medication to do a, to do a witness statement because his dad was a dentist. And what happened next was Michael wanted to go and challenge these allegations. He wanted to fight the life out of them. Problem he had is that there was no criminal act charges brought against him it was just civil and he had this big tour on the go and you have massive insurance policies so he got overruled and this is not out there enough if you go watch those documentaries square one and chase the truth on amazon prime you'll see and the documents are there his insurance company sat him down with a board of people saying i'm sorry mr jackson this is not your decision we will pay this to get rid of you we need you back on the road there's billions actually this is a 20 million problem or whatever it may be we'll get rid of this damn thing these liars, and the insurance company paid out. He, Michael never paid them out. He wanted to go and fight this damn thing, and he wanted them to file criminal charges. And now, this, was, this was the first allegation? 93. Of the it's opened up the flipping floodgates, didn't it? They, now, because of that, in America, the law changed. You can no longer make those allegations just go for money. You now have to do criminal case first, then do a civil cl claim after. So then nothing happened after that. There was all these stories about other, there is no other allegations. The next one that came about was in 2004 from Gavin Avisa, which Michael fought the criminal charges. He could have tried to settle it if he wanted to, I'm gonna fight the damn things. And was unanimously found not guilty on all charges, hands down in the hardest court in the world. Now bear in mind, this family hired the same legal team as the 1993 people did. And they had the same district attorney who was out to get him. And this whole profit in your hometown thing, they wanted to get Michael. And um, why was the DA out to get him? Just because he couldn't get him the first time around because he it would have made his name. He, so as soon as that trial ended, he, he was called Tom Snedden. The district attorney retired. He wanted to retire on the, putting the biggest star in the world in jail. And, and do you know what, Matt? I've been with Michael and the Jacksons in America and the racism they have to put up with is unbelievable. I couldn't, I, I, I used to hear it from Tito and Jermaine about people swearing up the street and calling them names and that. And until I witnessed it for myself, I couldn't believe it. Because with Michael, we, we would hide and try not to be with the public much because it was madness. But I'd hear Tito get racist remarks against him and stuff, and, and it was shocking. So there's a male element of that too. And then it turned out too that the FBI had a 10 year investigation into Michael Jackson as well, open. They couldn't find nothing. They couldn't do nothing. Now, the reason I stuck with him, I knew the guy really well. He used to hang out with my family and my kids. When my mum was dying of breast cancer, he was the biggest strength to me and her around. And the problem we had is that he was brainwashed by Motown to not be seen with a girl. Because if you're seen with a girl, your, your fan base will be gone. And Tito Jackson was the first to get married out of Jackson 5. And he was devastated. He thought, this is going to be the end of our career. Why did, why did you do this, Tito? He was crying. So we went to great lengths to hide his girlfriends, his wife, away from the public. Towards the end of his life, he started to get more open to the situation, where he made the fatal decision to work with Martin Bashir, that he hoped that was going to help him. But no, he had a problem with flipping women. He's a womanizer. He's the back of the car. We got audio footage. If you go back and watch the Michael Jackson footage, for anyone who wants to doubt me on this, Go back and watch Living With Michael Jackson, that fatal hit piece that was done against Michael. When Bashir, I was in that meeting, Bashir promised him all these things that never happened and, and stitched him up. Most of that footage was done on the last day because he did, knew Michael would never see him again because thought, Michael thought Michael was his friend. Go and turn up the volume where the female fans are saying, Michael, can we have a hug? And he said, sure, you can have a hug. And as he's hugging them, he said, I'll give you more than a hug. While that's happening, they turn down and Martin talks over because it goes against the whole narrative of the program. 
And this is the issue. Now, let's go back and talk about his bedroom. Now, I don't condone anyone sleeping in someone's bed, but Michael never slept in their flipping bed. Now, you want to talk about his bedroom. It's, it's massive, man. It's like, it's two stories, three bathrooms, arcade. It's his only private sanctuary he's got. There's nowhere else for Michael Jackson. Even when he walks around Neverland, he's got security for There's over 150 security staff there. Because people used to parachute in. So, oh, I don't know where I am. And they hope to meet Michael Jackson. He's got, and then he had a panic room in his room too. He says, secret sex chamber. What a load of nonsense. He used to hit the button at Neverland Security. He had to run to that damn panic room multiple times because people would parachute in or, or break the boundaries. And he had stuff in there to keep him entertained and stuff for, for how long it took to his safe to come out again, like many billionaires do and multi-millionaires do. But no, there's nothing untoward. And, 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 um, but, but are you saying kids did or didn't sleep in his bed? They did not sleep with him in his bed. He used to sleep on the floor, go to the bedroom upstairs. It was on two well, stories. In the same room then, or not in the same room? They used to fall asleep watching movies together and his nephews and nieces. And, but not just where this boys thing come from. It was girls, boys, adults, staff were in and out. The door's not locked or nothing. People used to come in and out. Now, I'm not saying this right, right. He should not have done it, especially after 93. He should have been... Wary. I guess that's what I'm trying to get. And like I say, I'm not trying to not trying to be baiting you or be, or, yeah, or be yeah, offensive. Yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, as a parent, you wouldn't presumably want your kids to go and watch a movie and sleep with Michael Jackson while you're out for dinner with your missus. He, my, Michael used to he used to go and hang out with my kids all the time, and I'd be in the same building. But I won't leave anybody who's not known to my family with him now. With Michael, I had no problem with him being with my kids because I knew what he was about. And a lot of the time too, they don't want to talk about the fact that these kids keep trying, like some of the kids around back then, like Macaulay Culkin, for mm. instance, you know, and- Was that a legitimate friendship? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. That, that Michael used to tell me I was his best friend. And when he, Michael used to fall asleep on the bed watching movies with his family, with his nephews, nieces, and a few people used to hang around. His freaking wife used to be there as well. Lisa Marie Presley used to say, I was there. Why don't everyone mention the fact that I was there in the bed with Michael too, falling asleep? You know, but hey, it's I think I think I'm just actually looking at uh, looking at my internet now because I think just in the last couple of days something's come out again recently, hasn't it? Which was the uh, the accusers. I'll tell you that you'll know the names. Yeah, Wade and they, James. Wade and James. They've um, they've seek to open the sealed records that include new photos going. of him. So they lost their appeals. They were the star witnesses in the 2004 case. Both of them, same age as me, and um, they were there saying things that never done to them or anything and then they changed their story later on down the line and I didn't think you could do that like lie on oath but apparently once you get past a certain amount I think it's seven years in the United States you can't do you for it and they sued for money they made this hit piece documentary which was four hours long a lot of that's been proven to be untrue now James I think it's out there on the internet as well now James said he was abused in a train station by Michael Jackson and it turned out that that train station wasn't even built until he was in his mid-twenties I can't imagine Michael Jackson taking the train he had his own train station, never mind. <laughs> well, we did take the train, actually. We used to take the train from Paddington. He loved it. That was his best form of transit. He used to love it. He hated flying. So we, we took the train once from Paddington to Exeter, and lots of times we did that around New York and things like that. So, yeah. But no, it's all nonsense. The guy was into women. I mean, if you're going to go after someone and bring them down, child molestation, murder, rape, the things that you're going to go. And once you've been accused of that, you're over, aren't you? Michael never recovered from that. But I will say, and, and it... No one was around him strong enough to say, other than Yuri Geller, he would say, this is not looking good to the world. You should not be hanging around with kids, especially after what you accused of 93. I know it. your insurance company paid it off and you're innocent. You've got women, but you need to start cleaning up your image a bit. And he oh. tried to do that through Martin Bashir and it didn't work. And, and what, what was Michael's reaction to that? I mean, did, did he agree? It'll shut you out of your life. Yeah, if, if Michael heard stuff you didn't want to hear, you'd get shut out. I used to see those people shut out. Now, I, I, I wish I was a bit stronger on him, Matt, but I was, I was just in my 20s. I, I didn't feel I could raise my voice. I did with the drug usage. I thought he was going to kill himself. But he would shoot me down, you know, because I was just a guy, karate teacher to him in his 20s, who's, as far as Michael was concerned, he may be a multimillionaire for his knowledge and power. And, and I was just, uh, yeah, who was I to say to him? But Yuri Geller used to sh shout at him and, he, but he shut Yuri out. I was going to say, would he shut Yuri out yeah. as well? Yeah. He shut Yuri out. Yuri used to shout at him, you've got to stop doing this. The world don't perceive it right, you know? It's, it's... Look, one way to sum it up, I've got an incredible home in Devon. If someone moved next to another incredible home next to me who appeared to be a single man, 
having kids come and sleep over, of course I'll call the police, I would. But Neverland was built not for his, him to be a home. He made that for Make-A-Wish Foundation. Over 10,000 children a year were bust into Neverland to make their wish come true. It was like a fairground, their zoo, everything you can imagine. That's what it was built for. So they, they say multiple accusers. There's not multiple accusers. There's only ever two. And these last two guys have been proven to be fraudsters. They've lost two of their appeals. Now they're going again because there's been a slight law change after it. But he's not even here to defend himself anymore, is he? And back in 2005, both Wade and James said they nothing happened to them. And they're suing for hundreds of millions of pounds, uh, dollars. And when that TV program was made, the four-hour hit piece, they never mentioned that. I think had they mentioned that they are suing the Michael Jackson state for money, a lot of people would have switched over. A lot of media would have ignored it. What's Neverland up to now? Is it still there? Yeah, so they, they're filming the um, biopic there at the moment. Oh, okay. but does it it's like... private buyer. One of his mates bought it. Okay, and it's, it's just he stays, lost that in two thousand and five, a few years before he died. He lost that, got repossessed. Well, so Matt, it has been a wild conversation, which can't possibly do justice to the wildness of your life over the last uh, twenty, well, say twenty-five years since uh, pro pro probably since that guy first nicked your milk back when you were seven ah, years old. Yeah, um, he's a legend. What, what's uh, what, what's the next 30, 40 years hold for you? Well, we're going to stick the MF legacy. I'm going to keep building. We've got MF martial arts schools opening all around the world. We're still expanding with our franchises. We've got MF dance, MF Pilates, MF yoga, MF yoga. We've got my property portfolio, which is still ever expanding, I'm still buying more than ever now. Bargains are back again. So I'm building that. And what I enjoy most, I run something called the Money Freedom Club, which is something that I do for fun. It's more of a passion project for me. It's not, it's only like 10 or a month. But for me, it's getting like-minded people in the room, giving them proper, hard, honest advice about how to make money. The Money Freedom Club, MF.club. And and I just bring, I do an event on every three months. There's no selling, there's no pitching allowed. I bring my celebrity contact book to them. We talk about anything from social media to media to property investing, all the different sectors of that, how to build wealth. Because I don't think there's enough people teaching you how to become financially free out there. It's not taught at school, college, university teachers. You get a university degree in business. You're getting taught by lecturers who's never owned a business before. He's basically broke. Um, the world's in a mess. So I enjoy that. I, so I'm going to keep expanding MF Club and teaching and mentoring people how to make money, invest, and grow businesses and build their own economy rather than worry about the, our governments, which aren't, in the UK anyway, aren't doing a very good job. And we'll put the link uh, down, in the, uh, down in the show notes on the podcast, but just give yourself a, a little mention for where we can find it's you It's very simple. If they just go to www.mf.club, .mf like in your website, on there you've got all my social medias too. Uh, official Matt Fidesz, follow me on Instagram and I'll DM me, you'll get me, not a VA, I'm very, I, I like you know people stay in contact with people and if you, maybe they're struggling with their mental health or they want some guidance here and there then just DM me and I'm, I, they'll get me responding. Awesome, well Matt it's been an absolute pleasure, thanks for taking thanks, time out so while you've been yeah. here in Dubai. Been a pleasure, thank you. Thanks for watching Stripping Off with Matt Haycox. I hope you've enjoyed watching this week's episode, but please remember to like and hit that subscribe button so you can stay in the loop for future episodes. Have you got any burning questions? Have you got any killer ideas? Or well, slide into my DMs on social at Stripping Off with Matt Haycox or simply comment below. And I'll see you again next time.